Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Kane Audio vlog and it's Friday so it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Apologies for not getting one done last week. I was away so didn't get a chance to do one before I went away. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to get one but if you made it to the end of last week's video then you'd have known that anyway. Um, First of all, house admin stuff. I think last week I said I had signed a track to Mousetrap for We Are Friends 8. I've now been selected as a Frisky Radio Artist of the Week. So I've literally just now put together a two hour mix for Frisky and my track on Mousetrap will be on that and I think it's being aired June the 5th so there's that to look out for uh, and I think that is basically it for house admin so yep let's crack on <clears throat> uh, right I've loaded up the page and first is Distorts. What are your thoughts on Moog's new grandmother semi-modular synth? Loving the long ass videos, by the way. They make me go bananas. Good. High five. Um, yeah, I think it looks good. The, the grandmother. Um, I'm kind of toying with the idea of going for the Mother 32. I don't think the grandmother appeals any more than that to me um, but it does look good so yeah I don't know uh, I think I probably need to try both of them side by side um, before I make my mind up but having said that before I commit to more synths there is another one that I've got in my mind that I wouldn't mind getting um, but I did also briefly mention last week in the AMA, I think I mentioned, not last week, week before, uh, moving studio and uh, rebuilding a new one. Um, so I kind of can't really commit to more new synths just yet. Anyway, Casey Music. Hey Dom, uh, you were absolutely right. I mean, of course you were just wanted to point it out. Um, Change the octave for some selected mids worked very well. Already messed with multiband compression this week. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So that was the question. Uh, if anyone didn't see that, uh, the question was about bringing out the mids in tracks. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned was changing the octave of the synths. Uh, I have other questions for you. Do you have any experience with Sonarworks reference? No, never heard of it. I kind of searched for a way to get my headphones straight for on-the-go production and stumbled over that solution, but I'm a bit sceptical. Um, well, I mean, if, if your headphones are too bassy or too trebly or whatever, then I suppose you know, using some software to counterbalance that is probably a good thing. But yeah, I'm a bit sceptical only because I I feel like if you're using software to, to cheat software to cheat hardware to cheat your ears, you, you've kind of got a whole chain of things that aren't quite right. And I think it's like... <sighs> To me, it's like having a big gash all down your arm and just using loads of band-aids to, to hold it all together when that's not really the best way to do it. So it doesn't not work, but I don't know. Uh, does being signed to Mousetrap mean regular income or do you get paid per work? Uh, it, it's uh, just like any other record label. Um, you get paid royalties for your releases. Uh, yeah, it's just like any record label. Uh, 
And a third question just came to my mind. Uh, you stated that you wanted the channel's peak at maximum minus 10 dB for your mix downs. Does this only apply to the individual channels or the mix bus and master too? So that's individual channels. As so with Bitwig, I've mentioned before, I set my default channel gain to minus 10 dB, which basically means that if I was to stick on a limiter for some reason on any given channel and max it out, then it would only reach minus 10 dB. Um, so my, my actual channel gains reach anything from say minus 15, maybe minus eight dB. Um, and the reason for that is because then my master channel, I know will definitely be below zero dB when it when they all get added together into the master. I know it's going to be less than zero dB. So I know there's just plenty of room to work with. Uh, so that's the reason I do it. I pick minus 10 because it works not for any other reason. You know, you could probably set it to minus six, I suppose, and you probably wouldn't peak in the master. You could set it to minus 20, but then everything's really quiet and you're going to turn your sound system up. Um, so it's just a case of finding a balance, I guess. Uh, thank you so much for always answering all the questions. The longer the video, the better. Cool. I don't think there are as many questions on this. I did have a quick skim through. Um, and because I've been away, my battery's running down to halfway already. So, uh, yeah, it might not be as long today. Uh Equinofficial Bananas, high five. Deadly Custard. Uh, hey Dom, I've been told uh, that mixing on headphones is far from ideal. So I'm going to finally sort out a dedicated studio space. I have a small spare room uh, to use, six and a half foot by nine foot. Uh, any tips or cheap solutions to how to make this studio space audio friendly? Um, okay, first thing I would say is, you know, you see lots of producers using like that egg carton shape foam stuff on their wall or the the ribbed ridged one whatever it is the sort of roof looking tiles uh don't use those they're rubbish um they might soften a bit of the treble if you've got a really echoey room but they don't really do much more than that. Um, I would suggest looking at, if you want cheap, build them yourself. There are loads of, like, if you go to uh, Gear Sluts or KVR Audio forums, um, I think both of those have, like, a DIY section. Uh, but basically, strips a 2 by 4 build a frame, get yourself some, like, uh, I think it's, I could be wrong on this, it's off the top of my head, but... 45 kilo per square or per cubed meter rock wool so that's the density um you can get it like 70 mil thick so if you get 70 mil planks of wood build a little picture frame and slot in slot in uh some rock wool um and then cover it in well the the fabric that covers these so speaker grill cover is a good idea uh, if you can get some of that probably cheap on ebay uh, bed sheets to be honest would do it uh, or your wife's or girlfriend's or mother's pair of tights stretch that over um, so yeah so if you want to go super cheap that's the way to go uh, i reckon a, a big bag of the rockwell slabs you can pick up on ebay for uh, few maybe 10 15 pounds for six or seven slabs of it so pretty easy uh also while on the subject would you recommend the use of a sub in addition to studio monitors in a small space not really not i mean the only time you should need a sub is if you feel you need more bass um it all depends on the space uh, it depends on, you know, the, the quality of sound in any room depends on so many things like the density, the absorption levels of the walls, the amount of acoustic treatment, the positioning of the listener, the positioning of the speakers, the height of the speakers. 
uh, any other sound deadening in the room. So do you have a sofa, a bed, a bookshelf? You know, all of these things change the acoustics of a room. So a sub might work in one room and then not in others. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to judge, but generally speaking in a small room, uh, you've said my monitors go down to 50 hertz. Uh, you shouldn't really need a sub then because maybe if you're doing like liquid drum and bass or something then maybe but really you, you know when it comes to a mix down a master 50 well we'll say 40 hertz down you're starting to slope things off anyway you know you, you don't really want anything below 30 hertz anyway so is you, you're only missing between 30 and 50 and that 30 to 40 is so low down um you probably don't need to monitor that, to be honest. Uh, bananas indeed, high five. Uh, Jokamaya, thank you for answering my question and thanks for the input on Next Level Music. I'm only five years into this and I'm glad I made this much progress while working a full-time job and being a single dad. High five for being a single dad. Uh, just acquired an MPC live and who knows, I might merge hip hop with drum and bass or prog house. Thanks again. Yeah, you know, uh, if you look at Pendulum, they did like trance melodies with drum and bass. Uh, you know, it's, it's a case of just whatever you fancy, I suppose, you know. Uh, Andy Ruiz, uh, hey Dom, thanks for answering my questions as always. I hope I can make this one before the video uh sorry it's late uh yeah so i'm technically a week late so you're probably a week early uh are you married sorry if that's too personal no i'm not married uh but not to say i won't be at some point in the future who knows um why is the track called so sue me uh okay so it's a variation on a spelling of a triad chord which is the bong you hear when you switch on an apple mac and the guy who invented that wanted it to sound japanese so used the word susumi because it was just a one chord and obviously you can't really copyright a single chord and they wanted to copyright the apple chime and to get it past the lawyers, he made it sound Japanese and, and called it Susumi uh, and it got past the lawyers. And so that was my sort of homage to that because the chords I use or the sound design of the chords I use in Susumi, uh, I felt were a bit sort of, if I'm totally honest, a bit sort of generic dead mouse type sound and... I thought, well, I can get away with it because I'm signed to his label, so sue me. Um, so yeah, so that was why I called it Susumi. Uh, would you say your music has emotional storytelling behind it? I know some people just make stuff without thinking about a story or emotion behind it, which is cool. And some other people like Matt Lang, who uh, I am also a huge fan of, want to put a lot of emotion behind their music, which is also cool. What do you think? Yeah, so with, I would say there are some tracks I put out where I just want to make a, a banger that works well in a club or fits in my DJ set or, you know, it has a function. Um, whereas when it came to my EP, that's absolutely storytelling from my part. Um Although I'm kind of hesitant to even call it storytelling because it's not it's not one long narrative, but more, I guess, themed in terms of sound design um, and production techniques and workflow. So it's more. It's come from my personal space in my head that, that meant something to me at that moment in time uh, so that the, the structures theme was all sort of molecular based and quantum physics. -y nerdy stuff um but there was also some stuff that was kind of intertwined i was sort of com at the time i'd been reading on a bit of sort of quantum physics and 
I was kind of comparing in my head human relationships compared to, say, relationships of, say, a gluon or quark or whatever to the electron. And so I guess it's kind of storytelling, but I don't know. It is what it is. Uh, yeah, so that's what I think. Um, so, yeah, I have no problem with people who don't care about storytelling. Music doesn't need to tell a story, but I think it's good if it does. Um, so that's that. Uh, Cav, OK. Uh, Dom, brilliant AMA and thanks for answering my question. Bananas, high five. Uh, any chance you could do a video on your workflow in Harrison Mixbus? I just picked up Mixbus 32C in the sale, so any helpful pointers would be very welcome. Yeah, I think I might do another mix down series at some point. Uh, I will wait for the right track and the right client to come along because obviously I need their permission and also I'll need the label's permission. So it needs to be one that's signed. There's a whole combination of things that need to happen first. But yes, I am planning on adding to the mix down series for this channel um, and yeah, that will be in Mixbus 32C uh, because it is great. It's a brilliant bit of software for mixing, uh, or it is for me anyway. It just suits my workflow. Uh, Lumby Legend. Hey, Dom, uh, now that you've released your Structures EP, is there any plans on a tour, possibly Mousetrap Detroit Warehouse Party? Uh, yes and no. It's kind of a difficult one um, because... I Mousetrap haven't done any parties in the UK since I've been signed to them. If they did, then clearly I would be front of the queue for that one. Um, in terms of going to America for Mousetrap, to my knowledge, uh, I guess all the American producers would be front of that queue for them. So uh, I would love to, and next time I head over to America, if it ties in with the Mousetrap Party, then that would be great. But I think if I look at it from Mousetrap's perspective, um, I'm not sure they would want to spend that much money on my flights and hotel and getting me over there uh, when they could have someone local their own artists who are local you know in LA or whatever um, but I would totally be up for a Detroit warehouse party um, so it doesn't even have to be a mousetrap event um, yeah and in fact I'm I'm quite keen to start getting back out there again this year with gigs so uh, yeah don't ask me ask your local promoters uh, I guess that's the the way to approach it really is it's not up to me where I play. I most likely say yes to any promoter. So, but it's up to the promoter to book me rather than me to pester a promoter. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Uh, Nathan Zaskarinskis, uh, bananas Don, bananas every time. High five. Finn Fighter, bananas. High five. Janice Lucknellis, bananas. High five. Uh, Lumby Legend, I was wondering why people were commenting bananas. Well, high five for saying it. St. Nicholas, bananas, high five. Rod Marconi. Uh, hi, Dom. With your in-depth knowledge and years of experience, have you ever considered setting up your own record label? I did run my own record label from... 2003 until... 2000. Eight, nine, ten, something like that. Um, it's it's not really for me. I don't think. I, I kind of found that w when I first started, we were putting out vinyl. We were with a good vinyl distributor, and things were going well. And we were getting lots of support. Um, and then I think everyone and their dog became a record label, and I think that became difficult to run and also as as a producer I, I wanted to be spending my time making music not 
doing paperwork for a record label and working on promotions and marketing and you know I, I I've said in several of these videos I'm I'm no good at marketing I don't I barely even market myself let alone brands I'm associated with or whatever um, it's just not something that I'm aware of I suppose it's not that I'm no good I just I just don't know what I'm supposed to do there so so I think running a record label is not really my thing uh, it's not my strength and when there are 30 good zillion billion trillion record labels out there um, I don't think that I would have any unique selling point uh, necessarily so I think based on my in-depth knowledge and years of experience my response is don't run a record label <laughs> um, in fact there used to be an old saying of uh, in the music industry of uh, how to get a million dollars running a record label and the answer is start with two million um, which I think says everything you need to know and then finally that's it John Bloomfield Bananas, high five. Um, at last, I've kept it to just over 20 minutes, which was always the original plan. Once again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a great weekend. Please do like, comment, subscribe. Uh, ask me a question underneath this video, and I will be back same time, same place next week. And uh, I'll answer your questions then. Cheers. See you soon.